worship the Lord today. Busy morning, a lot going on, but we are excited, man, to have this opportunity today to worship Jesus Christ and to really give thanks as we're going into this week of Thanksgiving. It's a time to really pause and consider all that God has done uh, in our lives and really just to give Him thanks. And we have so much to be grateful for, and uh, we're going to pray in just a minute. But if you're a guest with us today, I'm Pastor Mike. And uh, we welcome you today to fellowship, and we would love to be acquainted with you. And if you could take that blue and white Connect card, take a minute and fill that out. We'll receive those later on uh, as in the baskets, and we would love to meet you after the service down in the Connection Center. My wife Cheryl and I will be down there. So please come by and see us. A couple of things going on today. If you'll notice in your handout at the bottom, we have a Connecting to Fellowship class coming up. And that is our first step into membership here at Fellowship. And that is either you can sign up for Sunday morning, December 8th at 11 o'clock, or you can sign up for Wednesday, December 11th at 6.30. And that's just a small group opportunity to learn more about fellowship and uh, what we are doing and who we are. And we'd love to be able to sit down and meet with you on that. And uh, hey, we are moving into the Christmas season. And so on the back of your handout, we have some important dates for you there. And that is December 22nd, that evening. We are having a Christmas celebration of music that night. And uh, then on Christmas Eve at 5 o'clock, candlelight service. And so some Christmas events coming up. We want you to be able to get those onto your calendar so that you can see what is coming up. Man, you guys have done a... Good job bringing in items for our food drive for Thanksgiving. We'll be putting together uh, food boxes for families over this holiday. And so this week, we do not have a Wednesday night midweek, but on Tuesday night, we'll be gathering in the Connection Center. We'll be loading up those boxes, praying over them, and then delivering them to the homes of people uh, that would really be blessed by that. So if you still have food to bring in, you say, man, I forgot. Bring it in tonight, bring it in before Tuesday night, and there's a large box in the Connection Center, and uh, we've just been continually emptying that, and you can place those items right there. I'm going to ask the choir to go ahead and stand at this time. We just go into the presence of the Lord and just thank Him for all of His goodness to us today. Our Father, Lord, we just pause to give you thanks and praise. God, you're so good to us, and Lord, often we don't stop to think and to acknowledge that. Lord, help us never to be guilty of forgetfulness and, Father, taking it upon ourselves, Lord, in our own strength to accomplish your will in our lives. So, Lord, this morning, I pray that your Holy Spirit would just move into this place. Lord, that you would just break through all the barriers of this week challenges of today. God, that you would just calm our hearts in Christ, help our hearts and our minds to put away the cares of this week and this life. Help us to just be zeroed in on, on Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Father, just be glorified in this place, in every song we hear or sing with. Father, may Christ be exalted. As we open the Bible, may Christ be exalted as the offering is taken, as we greet one another, as classes are taught throughout this property. Father, everything that we do, Lord, it's either for your glory or it's in vain. So, Father, we pause to acknowledge you, your Lordship, to yield to you, to ask you to fill us, Lord. And God, we just pray, Lord, that Christ would be exalted, uh, Lord, before your throne. We ask all of this this morning in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. If you would, I'll take this time, find someone you don't know, and welcome them to church this morning.
worship this morning. It's so awesome. Go ahead and be seated. Ushers, why don't you guys go ahead and come forward. And uh, man, what a great song. He never lets go. He says he will never leave us and he will never forsake us. And I love that song. And you know, in, in the down times of life, it's an anchor to hold on to that truth. And in the high seasons of life, it's just a greater reason to praise Him and rejoice and give thanks to the Lord. And really, that's what it's all about, remembering the Lord, giving thanks to Him. And before we receive our offering this morning as we prepare, if you're a guest with us today, let me remind you, we don't expect you to give today. We would love to receive that Connect card that you got when you came in. But please don't feel any pressure to give in the offering this morning. And members, regular attenders, by all means, feel pressure to give. No, I'm just kidding. No pressure. Hey, you know, I really believe that uh, pressure is a poor motive to do most things in life. And our greatest motivation, it's love and it's grace. And so we give to the Lord not out of have to, but out of get to. And we give out of grace and a gracious heart. And uh, just so thankful for that, that God is a God that we can approach and uh, receives us and receives our burdens and receives our difficulties. I mentioned the food drive earlier. Uh, that's the last, last day. Get that in before Tuesday. And then you'll notice when you came in, you also got with your... Um, notes handout. You got another handout and this is about our wise men gift extravaganza that we're doing this year. And uh, what we are doing is we are gathering presents. Three categories of presents. We got some gold presents. We got some frankincense presents. And we got some myrrh presents. Okay, like the three gifts of the wise men. And on here there are some suggested gifts that you can see what type of gift fits that category. And then we'll bring in all of those gifts. And then on the morning of Saturday, December 21st, we're inviting families in our communities to come and to shop for Christmas for their kids. We're not giving the toys to the kids. We're giving them to the parents. And so literally, we'll have guides that will meet the parent and that will walk them through the shopping area. And they will be able to get a gold gift, a frankincense gift, and a myrrh gift for each of the children in their home. And then they'll be able to take those to a wrapping room and there'll be folks there that will wrap those presents for them as others talk to them about the Lord. And I think the morning begins with breakfast for them. So it's a little different twist on what we're doing. We're doing it right here at the church. And if you'll notice, it has all of this information on the flyer, has the list of gifts, and it has the volunteer opportunities at the bottom. Volunteers to set up and sort gifts, to serve breakfast, registration, child care. In case someone happens to bring their children, we'll have a child care for them during that. We need personal shoppers that will help guide them, personal gift wrappers, prayer partners, and cleanup. And there's different dates, different times for each of these. So check that out and all the information about signing up. Uh, sign up for volunteer opportunities. You can do that online uh, beginning this Wednesday. And we would like those gifts to be in by the 18th, okay? And so this is a real opportunity to pour into the community. And we did our widows and fatherless outreach. We're just coming into our Thanksgiving uh, food box outreach. And now we're going to do... So the fall that's entering into Christmas, it's all about local community outreach. And we want to be the hands and feet of Jesus right here. So opportunity to serve him and to be a blessing in the many, many families. We're going to go at this time. We're going to bow our heads in prayer. Just going to invite God's presence into this offering. Give him thanks for it as we worship him in our gifts. Our Father, as we bow before you this morning, Lord, we do so with thankful hearts that we can be called your children. God, I just pray this morning that, Lord, you would just receive these gifts from our hands as an act of worship to you. God, we give out of grace. We give out of thankfulness because you're just so good to us, God. Father, we just want you to sense our love for you today as you fill us with your love because of Jesus, because of Calvary. Lord, I pray for this Tuesday night as we're able to deliver gift boxes, food boxes to families in need. Lord, the blessing of knocking on that door and providing thanksgiving for them. God, what a joy. And then moving into the Christmas season. Father, help this time of year not to be about us. Help it to be about others, Lord. Help it to be about this community in which you've placed us, God. Father, we just ask you to just be glorified in this time of offering. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
together this morning. Hallelujah, he's alive. Let's say that together. Hallelujah, he is alive. Man, and if you don't believe that, your believer's broken. Amen? This is why we come together. It's all about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And uh, man, that is the proof of what he did on the cross. And someone said he, he, writ, he wrote the check of salvation on the cross and it got canceled in the resurrection, and that's the proof of it. And uh, let me ask a question. Did we get that video? Is it ready to go? Okay, cool. So we're in. We're going to read. Not now, but it is. Okay, cool. We had a little technical difficulty this morning, and I appreciate it. Let's give it up for our team of volunteers that lead our music, our musicians, our media people. Man, just so much work goes in. I appreciate them so much. So I want you to turn over to Joshua chapter number 4. And I want to talk this morning on this subject, remembering the secret to a grateful heart. Remembering is the secret to a grateful heart. Joshua chapter 4. Sam asked Tom for a loan of $2,000. Tom said, absolutely not. And then Sam said, hey, when your business dropped off, who gave you $10,000 to keep you out of bankruptcy? He said, you did. 
He said, who took your daughter to Disney World when you were too busy and you couldn't take her? He said, you did? He said, who jumped in the rapids and saved you from drowning on that fishing trip? He said, you did. He said, well, why in the world would you not loan me $2,000? He said, you haven't done much for me lately. Hey, we forget, don't we? It's easy to forget and, and we lose sight of not just what people do for us, but what God does for us. You know, gratitude, one person said, may be the best measure of a gospel-centered life. Because gratitude tells us that we have been paying attention to the gifts of grace. Man, if we are paying attention to Jesus, we just came out of that whole series on, on the gospel, the gospel-centered life. You know, if we're paying attention to what Jesus did in our life, if we're paying attention to the cross, if we're waking up in the morning with praise and gratitude to him for delivering us from our sin, you know what? If we are thankful about that, that's the evidence that we are paying attention to what Jesus did. Because you can't really pay attention to all that Christ has done for us on Calvary without having a grateful heart. We learn from the scriptures that one of the best ways of growing forward in gratitude is remembering and rehearsing what God has done for us in the past. We're going to read this story in Joshua chapter number 4 beginning in verse 1 and it says, And it came to pass when all the people were clean passed over Jordan that the Lord spoke to Joshua saying, Take twelve men out of the people, out of every man a tribe, every tribe a man. Command them saying, Take hence out of the midst of Jordan, out of the place where the priest's feet stood firm, twelve stones. And you shall carry them over with you. And leave them in the lodging place where you will lodge tonight. Then Joshua called the twelve men whom he had prepared of the children of Israel out of every tribe of man. And Joshua said to them, pass over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of Jordan. And take up every man of you a stone upon his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel. That this may be a sign among you that when your children ask their fathers in the time to come. Saying, what mean you by these stones? You shall answer them. That the waters of Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it passed over Jordan, the waters of Jordan were cut off. And these stones shall be for a memorial unto the children of Israel forever. Now here's the story. Israel were slaves. The nation of Israel was slaves in Egypt. God brought them out of Egypt through Moses. Man, he parted the Red Sea. He fed them in the wilderness for 40 years under the leadership of Moses. Moses dies. Joshua takes over. And they come to the Jordan River. And they're finally ready to enter the land that God had promised to Abraham all these years earlier. And God says, as the water is there, he told them to step into the water. And as they did... The waters of the Jordan stopped from coming downstream. And rather crossing through water, the Bible says they crossed, as it were, on dry ground. And so God says, I want Israel, I want future generations to remember what took place here today. Joshua, here's what I want you to do. I want you to have a unified activity among the brethren. I want you to take one guy from each of the tribes because I want everyone involved. I want everyone included. And I want you to tell them to go out into the middle where the priest's feet stood. And I want them each to get one stone out of Jordan. And I want you to bring it over to the place where you're going to sleep tonight. Now, when you see that, the place where you're going to lodge, in my mind, I always have like this lodging hotel scene in my mind. But no, it was a camp scene. They were going to pitch their tents there, right? No hotels in the promised land. And they come over, and it says in the story that Joshua took the stones, and he piled them up there. And God said, those stones will serve as a sign or a mark or a memorial for all future generations. And one day there in Gilgal, when the generations to come say, what do these stones mean? Tell them this story. Tell them about the greatness of God. Tell them all that I did. And at the very end of the chapter, it says that all the earth may know the greatness of God and that you may Fear the Lord or worship and serve the Lord forever. And so God was saying to them and really to us, don't forget my blessings. 
Don't forget the hand of God. Don't forget those times past where God blessed you. Don't forget those present promises of God that he's laid up for you in your word. Don't forget the future hope that's laid before you in heaven and eternal life through Jesus Christ. You see, we need to never forget because remembering is the secret to a grateful heart. Notice, first of all, in your notes this morning, gratitude is rooted in remembering what God has done. Where does gratitude find its roots? Where does it find its origin? Gratitude begins in remembering. Thanking comes from thinking. Remembering the Lord. Remembering what he has done. Look at verse 6. He said, this may be a sign, a marker, or a memorial among you. Look at the second half of verse, half of verse 7. These stones shall be a memorial to the children of Israel forever. And in crossing the Jordan River... And the priests bearing the ark of the Lord and going before the people. And it's like God's presence in the form of the ark of the covenant guiding them out of the old life and into the new life of Canaan, into the promised land. That was a very significant event to Israel. Crossing Jordan signified to them the beginning of the inheritance that God promised to them in their new land. It was God doing once again what he had done at the Red Sea. It is God doing once again what he did at Sinai. What God did year after year in the wilderness and providing water and providing meat and providing clothing. It was God giving them markers or memorials along the way by which future generations could look back and they could track the hand and the blessing of God. You see, gratitude is rooted in remembering what God has done. Man, in Deuteronomy, Moses, just before he died, he reminded the children of Israel the importance of remembering the blessing of God. Deuteronomy 8, beginning in verse 11, Moses said, Beware that you forget not the Lord your God in not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes, which I command you this day. Lest, look what happens when you forget. Lest when you have eaten and are full and have built goodly houses and dwelt therein, and when your herds and your flocks multiply and your silver and your gold is multiplied and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart is lifted up and you forget the Lord your God, which brought you forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. God said, don't forget because if you forget, you're going to become prideful. When things are going great, you're going to credit it to yourself. And when things are going bad, you're just going to get mad at me because you have forgotten me. And you know, it's easy to do that. When times are hard and we're low, it's easy to cling to God. It's easy to be faithful, right? It's easy to have my morning prayers. It's easy to realize I can't even walk without you holding my hand. But then God starts moving in and God starts blessing and we start enjoying some of the fruit of our faith and our labors. And it's so easy when the good times come to forget all that God had done. God then reminded them there in Deuteronomy how that he had cared for them in the desert. How he provided for and he protected them. And he said all of this he had done to humble them with their good in mind. And then Moses warned them what would happen if they did forget God. Look at this verse on the screen. He says, and you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand has gotten me this wealth. Look what we have done. Man, look how God, we have made ourselves so blessable, God, that we can just take credit for all your goodness told you this story several times. A man I know years ago, there was a tremendous church near where I grew up, and it just fell apart and it decayed. And I met one of the original founders of the church. He said, here's the problem. When we got started, our attitude was, look what God has done. We were just in awe. How is this happening? Then he said, in time, it was, look what God has done through us. Look at our methods. Look at how they're working. Looking how, man, look, we got this down. He said, and slowly it deteriorated into, look what we are doing for God. He said, the day may come when you're saying in your heart, my power and the might of my hand has gotten me this wealth in the promised land. 
You see, if they forgot God, then rather than seeing the God as God is the giver of everything, they become proud and arrogant, as I said, when things are going well, or they become bitter and resentful toward God when things weren't going well. You see, both of these attitudes, pride and bitterness, are the results of ingratitude. They're the results of forgetting God. They're the results of forgetting the blessing of God. So we see, first of all, that gratitude really finds its birth in remembering all that God has done. But notice secondly in your notes, gratitude grows by sharing what God has done. So first of all, gratitude is rooted in remembering what he has done. But how does gratitude grow? It grows by sharing what God has done. It goes by telling others and sharing the blessing of God. Look what he said in chapter 4, the, I mean, the last part of verse 6 and verse 7. He said, when your children ask their fathers in the time to come, saying, what do you mean by these stones? He said, one day your kids are going to have questions. He says, they're going to ask, what do you mean by these stones? And look what he said, then you shall answer them. You need to share, you need to speak of my blessing. You will answer them that the waters of Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord when it passed over Jordan. The waters of Jordan were cut off and these stones will be a memorial to the children of Israel forever. Then you go to the end of the chapter, verse 21, 22. He spoke unto the children of Israel saying, when your children shall ask their fathers in time to come, saying, what mean these stones? Then you shall let your children know saying, Israel came over this Jordan on dry land. See, telling others how God came through in your life, man, that's a sign of gratitude. Man, God does something awesome for you. God comes through for you, and, and you hide it under a bushel, and you, you hoard the blessing. Do you realize when I share testimonies of God's goodness in my life, when I share my trust and my faith in him, and that's whether I'm sharing it to an unbeliever as a testimony or a witness, or if I'm just sharing it to a brother or a sister in Christ, just kind of encouraging one another, that is a sign of gratitude. But it's also a way of keeping gratitude growing and keeping it alive. You ought to write this down. Gratitude grows when gratitude is shared. Gratitude grows when gratitude is shared. God says, I'm going to come through for you. I'm going to do some awesome things in your life and in your church and in your family and your ministry. But you know how that gratitude is going to grow? You know how that gratitude, and we're going to talk about it in a minute, ultimately is going to lead to just a heart of worship toward me? It's going to grow when you share it. So when the kids ask you what that was, don't tell them, just be quiet and play a video game. And turn off the stinking video games and share with them the blessing of God. And talk to them about your salvation and talk to them about God's blessing in your family and how he brought things together and in our church and how he brought things together. You see, not only was that current generation challenged by the power of God, they now had a meaningful story to pass on to the generations that would come. You see, that's God blesses us as a testimony to his greatness. Look what the psalmist said, Psalm 78, beginning in verse 4. It said, God will not hide them from the children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he has done that they might, here it is, that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. Psalm 78, 4, he says, tell them. So they'll set their hope in God and that they won't forget the works of God, but they will keep his commandments. You see, we fail sometimes to remember or to consider how remembering the blessings of God and sharing them have such a great impact on the generation to come. 
You see the cycle throughout Scripture. God blesses a generation of people, and they are committed and sold out to the Lord, and they kind of halfway pass it on to the next generation and next generation. That's kind of the lukewarm generation. Then you get to that third generation, and that's the indifferent generation that's just completely forgotten about God. And sometimes in mercy, God steps in with a great move of his spirit and revival and, and calls us back to a proper understanding of his glory. But where is the failure? The failure lies when we're not passing on the blessing to the next generation. You know, that's what we do every time we observe the Lord's Supper. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty four. 24, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, talking about the bread. He said, take, eat, this is my body which broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. Now notice this last verse. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, what do you do? You show the Lord's death. Until he comes. I thought I had that verse up there. He said when you partake of the Lord's Supper. He says you're showing the Lord's death until he comes. You know why God calls us to the communion table? You know why God calls us to regularly partake of the Lord's Supper? The bread representing the body of Christ and the blood. The, the juice, the, the cup representing the, the blood of Christ. Why is that? It's because he said this is a memorial. He said do this in Remembrance of me. You see, so the Lord wants us never to forget the great debt of gratitude that we owe him because of what Jesus has done for us. We ought to be the most grateful people on the entire planet as we pause and we remember all that Jesus Christ has done. And sharing our gratitude is how our gratitude grows. And then look at this finally. Gratitude is fulfilled. Gratitude achieves its purpose for which God created it as we worship God for what he has done. See, gratitude comes to life in remembering what God has done. Gratitude grows in sharing what God has done. But gratitude reaches its high mark when we begin to worship the Lord and give him praise for what he has done. Joshua's telling him, God's telling Joshua what to do. And you get to the very last verse of the chapter, verse 24. And then God says, here's why I want you to do it. That all the people of the earth might know the hand of the Lord. That it is mighty. And that you might fear the Lord your God forever. Man, gratitude is the most selfless thing of all of our affections. Man, there's love, there's joy, there's peace. And sure, that's directed toward God. But man, we get the joy. We get the love. We get the peace. Do you realize gratitude is always focused on the object of the gratitude, never on ourself? Of all the virtues, of all these affections that we can have, Gratitude is the most selfless. It's just basically forgetting self, remembering God, and just thanking him for all that he has done for us. That's why I often say that gratitude is the highest form of worship that we can offer God. Maybe you think, no, singing and putting my hands in the air, that is the greatest form of worship I can give God, and I love to sing and put my hands in the air. That is not the greatest form of worship you can give God. I believe the highest form of worship we can ever offer to God is gratitude. It's gratitude. Trust in Romans 1, it says the cause of apostasy is when we forget God. It says neither were they thankful. It says they weren't thankful and their heart became darkened. Man, how's your gratitude meter this morning? When's the last time you told Jesus you loved him? When's the last time you thanked Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins? When's the last time you just say, God, I don't deserve any of this, but God, you're just so good to me. When's the last time you thank God for the people in your life that are important to you? When's the last time you thank God for your mom and dad? I'm going to pick on her. She's right there smiling at me. I'm going to nail her anyway. 
When's the last time you thanked your parents? When's the last time, man, you just thanked people? When's the last time you thanked God for giving you a, a great church? Man, the pastor's kind of shady, but the church and as a whole is pretty good. And do you thank God for that? Do you take it for granted? Do you take your friends and family for granted? Do you take your salvation for granted? Man, you forget God. He says your heart's going to become darkened. You know, here at Fellowship, we have so much to be thankful for. I was thinking about this over the years. Man, God has given us some wonderful memorials of his blessing. And I don't think we really look back enough to consider the hand of God in this place. Next month, we will celebrate 36 years as a church. Think about that. From a little rec room near a swimming pool in a, an apartment building called Society Park Apartments to a storefront on 56th Street, man. And we just got one storefront. It grew, had a knockout, a wall, just kind of took over the whole thing. And then God moved the church in the Tampa to a property with a building of sorts. And then God blessed the church with building a brand new auditorium. And then God blessed the church by selling a brand new auditorium. Because in between building it and selling it, they called a new pastor called Cliff Frank. And he was 29 years old and he wasn't scared enough to realize you don't sell a brand new building and move people out to the middle of nowhere. You just don't do that. I teach Gifted to Serve. It's a discipleship class. I taught it yesterday from 9 to 12. And we go through spiritual gifts. And whenever I talk about the gift of faith, I talk about Cliff Frank. I say, Cliff had the gift of faith, man. He just saw these woods and he said, he saw this. I said, I, don't, I have faith, but that's not mine. I'm more of the guy that comes in afterward and straightens everything out and arranges it and gets everything going in a straight line, you know? But God got us out here by this gift of faith. Do you realize this church was born of a tragedy? Do you realize Cliff was driving to high school and he had three kids in the car with him and they were hit by a concrete truck and three of them died? He was the only one that survived. And their former pastor, Scotty Drake, who had gotten out of the ministry because he was kind of mad at God and everyone else. And he went to visit one of those girls in the hospital as they were basically giving up on her. And as he left the hospital in the parking lot that night, Cliff Frank Sr., Cliff's dad, said, Scotty, you need to get back into ministry. Why don't we start a church? This church was born of tragedy. It got a bitter and mad preacher back into the ministry, and he in his 80s is still going strong today, traveling the world, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Man, memorials, memorials. Building a new building, selling a new building, meeting in a middle school for two years with those wretched yellow chairs, most hideous chairs. I wasn't at the church at that time. I did preach at the church once when I came down with the college group. The hideous plastic chairs, I mean, what a blessing. And then coming out here in the middle of nowhere, who buys 30 acres in the middle of the woods? There's nothing out here. His dad said to him, we have one of our videos somewhere where his dad says, boy, ain't nobody going to come to church out there in them woods. And man, how many of y'all started to come to church out here since it was out in the woods? Raise your hand. You began coming when, on this property. You began coming to this church after it moved to this property. Put your hand in the air. Okay. It's a lot of people, right? Boy, people are going to come to the church in them woods. He said, daddy, I believe that's what God is telling me. That's what we're going to do. And you know, coming onto this property wasn't without incident. The county didn't want us to build on this property. We are in the middle of a preserved upland habitat. Do you know, this church has received, I think, the only exemption from upland habitat that's ever been given in this area is this property. Church gave them options. They said, you can give us half of your property and build on the rest. You can put money, you can pay us for half of your property and we'll put it into a turtle sanctuary. It was like, and, and you know what? This church is, they're meeting in a middle school. They're just trying to do the will of the Lord. And they called a meeting of the county commissioners. Make sure that computer is unmuted, okay? And I, I wanted to take you back in time to a clip of that meeting. Hope it works. We asked the Lord what we should do. He showed us a piece of property. We came. We said, Lord, you've showed us this property. This is what you want. As a congregation, 
We voted unanimously. That doesn't happen a lot, at least not in Baptist churches. We knew God was moving our hearts to do it. The next thing we know, the county sits us down and says, you've got three options with your property. Three options. You can either give half, you can either go out and find the equivalent, same watershed, or you can donate to the Habitat Bank, the amount per acre. I was flabbergasted. I, I checked, make sure, you know, I'm in America, right? This is America? Yeah, we're in America. All right. I, when I go out there, I don't see little turtles digging around. And by the way, on the phone, Bernie Kaiser told me, I said, who do we go to to get the turtles removed? He said, you have to go through fish and game. You go through fish and game, and once you settle that with fish and game, then you go to the habitat bank and take care of the habitat. And I say, well, is there somebody that we could get, you know, to get those turtles? He said, you know, they're probably, I don't know what they'll even do with those turtles. Now, you, can you see how frustrated I am? I don't see little turtles, and I don't see fox squirrels, and I don't see soil samples and all these things. And I respect the environment. This, the Lord is the earth and the fullness thereof. I'm not going out there to pour toxic waste in the ground, and I'm not going out there to shoot the squirrels. I don't even like turtle. I don't want turtle soup. I mean, that's not my goal. But when I go out there, I see little boys and little girls getting off a bus and coming into a Sunday school class and hearing about Jesus and their life changing, and maybe they won't get shot someday. That's what I see when I go out there. That's what I see. Amen. Amen. When, I see, when I go out there, I see our families, and some of them are about to get divorced, coming out there for a retreat. And maybe their marriage being salvaged, and their little kids, you know, maybe don't have to be in a split home. That's what I see when I go out there. And when I go out there, I see missionaries in foreign countries who are trying to win their people to Christ, and they have nothing. They don't have anything. And our people have Bibles. I got five Bibles. And we can take those Bibles, and we can put them together, and we can mail them overseas, and they'll have a word of God in their hand for the first time. That's what I see when I go out there. And so all we want to do is build a church. Amen. Man, isn't that good? Man, I, I, I love that guy, and I am, I'm privileged to follow him as pastor. Man, you just raised your hand, all you people. He saw this before it happened. Why? Because God was leading. You see, this property, these buildings, the people in them, so much to remember and to be thankful for. God has done so much. Man, we sat there in 2013 and we burned the mortgage and we were debt free and man, no debt paid for. And then the pastor said, let's get in debt again. And since 2015, I figured this out, from 2015 until today, we have built three and a half million dollars worth of buildings. Extension on the fellowship hall, connection center, all of the site work, three and a half million dollars. And you know, in, in four years of doing that, we raised over $2 million of that. And we borrowed a million and a half dollars of that. But you know what? Let's never take any of this for granted. Let's not forget God. Let's not become arrogant and think we did it. Let's not become grumbly and act like we haven't been greatly blessed. But you know what? There is more to come. God's not done. God's not done. You know, I was approached about a month ago by a man, and he said, you guys, let me see the parameters on your debt. Maybe I can figure out a way to help you pay that debt off sooner. You know, I'm good with numbers. He sent me an email two weeks ago, and this is legit guy. I know him well. And he said, for three years, I'm committing to offer dollar to dollar to every penny you put on your mortgage for the next three years, up to three quarters of a million dollars. Does that just happen? Do you realize we already have 125,000 set aside that we were putting on the note next month? Do you know that just became $250,000 going on the loan? Do you know that? Do you know our mortgage payment is $8,500 a month? Do you know we already pay $10,000 a month? And beginning next month, we're going to start doing $11,000. Do you know that payment just became $22,000 a month? Do you realize after what we do next month and after the regular payments we're already making, you know what's left for us to come up with to be out of debt in three years? The equivalent of 120 people giving $10 a week extra for three years, and we are out of a million and a half dollars debt. 
About $200,000 more, and we are done. We are debt free. Now, I told someone about this, and I said, Man, are you nervous when you tell the church that they're going to say, We just finished a three year campaign, and, and now you're going to lead us into getting out of debt? I said, I have a name for people like that. I said, Idiots. No, I, I did say that actually, but if you're one of them, I'm sorry. Do you realize what we raised in three years in the campaign we ended a year ago? That this is one-fifth of that in three years. You say, well, what's the big deal about being out of debt? Being out of debt, it's the freedom to dream. Being out of debt is God saying, I'm not done yet. I'm not leaving you there. I don't know how many people tell me, don't build that building because Jesus is going to come back and you're never even going to get it paid for. I said, well, Jesus doesn't want us sitting on the front porch when he comes back twiddling our thumbs. He said, occupy until I come, not because you're thinking about me coming. God's not done yet. God is just beginning the work of reaching people and salvaging families and, and boys and girls. And man, what started as tragedy is God just continuing to move forward and to bless us. So the question is, what's next? God is once again giving us the freedom to dream. God is allowing us to engage our community and beyond with the life-changing gospel and love of Jesus Christ. God is allowing us to continue to connect in worship, to, to gather in community, to grow in his word, and, and to live on mission together. Man, God's just given us the freedom to dream. So as we come into this Thanksgiving week, don't you dare forget all that God has done. Don't you think God is done? God just laid three quarters of a million dollars to us because someone, God led someone that believes in what we are doing here. And we just need to continue doing that for the glory of God. So let's be grateful. Let's show thanks. Let's show gratitude for all he has done. Let's stand together this morning. Let's give him thanks. Why don't you just connect with one or two people next to you there. Just kind of form a little prayer circle. Grab a couple of people around you. Just grab someone right around you. Just form a little prayer circle. Maybe you know, maybe you don't. Hey, if you're uncomfortable with this, you pray by yourself, that's fine. No problem there. Why don't you just together, just pray. Just right now, someone lead your group. Just in a, a prayer of gratitude and thankfulness to the Lord. Just pray. Just go to him now. Father, as we come to you in Jesus' name, we come with thankfulness. We come with grateful hearts. Father, we don't want to forget you. We don't want to forget all that you have done. and God, all you continue to do. Lord, you do the unthinkable. You do the unimaginable. Father, you just, God, just load us with your blessings, your benefits. Father, we thank you for this place. We thank you for the people that fill this place. We thank you for the missionaries around the world who are being reached through this place, God, and being sent to countless souls around the world coming to know Jesus Christ. God, because you keep us strong, Lord. Father, I just ask you, Lord, as we break from this time of worship, 
God, that we might just walk out of here with a renewed gratitude and strength and faith. God, in all that you have done, and we'll shout, our God is good. Great is your faithfulness. Lord, just be glorified in our lives and through this place. We pray it all in Jesus' name and for his sake alone. Amen, amen, amen. Man, thank you guys so much. And I wanted to share this with you and just, just a testimony of your guys' faithfulness. Last week we had a missionary come in, had a come back from Africa and just some series of things trying to get it together. Really last minute had him come into the church here and it took a love offering. We were able to give them $5,000 last Sunday morning. Man, thank you guys so much. What a blessing that meant to them. And, and I'll tell you what, we're, we, you know, we're a church, Sunday attendance, about 500 people. Man, but you guys are just so faithful and consistent. I'm going to send you a letter here in the next week explaining what we're doing moving forward. But I'll let you know right now, we're going to do a first fruits offering of this at Christmas. So our Christmas offering this year is going to be a first fruits offering toward the debt. It'll get doubled, whatever comes in. That's pretty cool, huh? And then I'll be talking to you beginning of January about what we need to do in three years to kind of knock this thing out, okay? Man, isn't God good? Isn't he great? Man, I'm going to be down in the Connection Center. I'd love to meet you. Come on by. And uh, guys, have an awesome, awesome day and a Thanksgiving. God bless you.